Happiness is not a feeling, but love isn't either. Love is a commitment. Martin Luther King, one time he gave this very beautiful sermon on the most transgressive passage in the Christian Bible, which is Matthew 5, 44, love your enemies. Jesus says, you have heard that you should hate your enemies and love your friends. I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Jesus doesn't say to like your enemies. That's a sentimental thing. To like is to feel, to love is to decide. This is what's going on between you and your wife. The satisfaction, the disciplining of your own will comes from the decision to love her. That's the magic. That's the magic in marriage. That's the magic in friendship. That's the magic that you can have in a relationship with your kids. Look, if it were all about your feelings, hell, I'd be divorced. God knows my wife would bail on me. I mean, it's a pain being around me. She decides every day to love me. I think most people would look at someone like you and be a bit confused because on the one hand, you're a scientist, you're a serious intellectual guy, and yet you describe yourself as having a very strong religious faith. Right. And yet you don't have a hard time talking about things that occurred, you know, hundreds of thousands of years ago and millions of years ago. Right. In other words, you don't have a difficult time reconciling science and faith. No, not at all. And part of the reason for that is because faith and reason have to coexist in the same way that understanding a Picasso painting and understanding Picasso the man are utterly reconcilable, but not the same thing. The painter and the painting are not in conflict with each other. They're both important things to understand. But there are many religious people right. who take a very literal view yeah. of, say, the Bible yeah. and would say, well, the earth is 6,000 years old or whatever. They need to study more science. Yeah. It's my, my view that, that that's basically... They're taking things too literally. They're taking things not, not just too literally. They're not understanding that there's an intellectual bifurcation between the concept of the creation, the myth of how that actually creation takes place, which is the literalness that you're talking about, and then the, the evidence, the awe-inspiring evidence of the, cre of the creation itself. You know, one of the reasons I'm religious is because of science. And every time I learn something new, I'm like, oh, thank you. What a wonderful gift. Now, and again, it doesn't also freak me out that I might be wrong. It doesn't freak me out that I might be wrong about the science. It doesn't also freak me out that I might be wrong about the religion. I don't think so, but, you know, maybe that's okay. That's absolutely okay. My view has always been those who have a religious view are more fortunate. Yeah. And I especially think that in, in terms of dealing with death. Right. I think it's much easier to, to process death if you believe that there is a life after death. There's in, meaning in, this, in a different, on a different, di in different right. dimensions. Whereas if you right. really only think right. about this through the lens of biochemistry, uh -huh. uh, you know, it's a blank screen. Um, well, that's because in, if you only think of it in terms of biochemistry, death is, is a what question, which is in a spiritual dimension, death becomes a why question. Hmm. Right. And those yeah. are different interrogatives that have different philosophical and emotional content. Now, there's this area in between right. of, of spirituality, which is not religion. And right. if I were going to lump myself into a category, it would probably be around the idea that I find enormous pleasure in nature. Yeah. Um, uh -huh. And that is the closest, I suppose, I get to religion. That's a transcendent experience, and that's really what we're talking about. It's why about. I live here. Uh -huh. like you no, see I where it. I live. I live in the middle of nowhere. It's so beautiful. And it's why I have to be outside every single day. Yep, I get it. I get it. No, I, I get it. And that's very common, by the way. A lot of people get transcendence from nature. So what does a person do who lives in a very busy urban center where they are surrounded by a wall of concrete all day, every well, day? Well, if that turns out to be uh, d destructive to your transcendence, is that a reason to move? Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. For some people, not everybody. I know some people don't want to leave Manhattan. Yep. And part of the reason is because they get their transcendent from other dimensions of life, right? Maybe they are religious. Maybe they're traditionally religious. Maybe they are serious meditators. Maybe they do actually get it from, they become completely awestruck from music yep. and, you know, or human genius, you know, those kind. Of, again, yep. it really gets back to transcending your littleness, transcending that. And that transcendent experience is, has it, it what, are, what it does is it gives you the same benefit as a religious journey. So basically what you're saying is Big, we need to take us, yeah, we need, we need to talk about something much broader yeah. than uh, religion For in sure. a formal sense. And awe can be yeah. the religious belief. It could be an, an obsession or an appreciation of, of great music or art yes. or meditation can yeah. be the place where you tap transcendence. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, absolutely. Now, it's also very convenient to not invent your own physics on this. And mm. so the Catholic Church is really, really good for me. And one of the things also is not what I feel. It's what I've decided to do.
This is an important thing to understand about transcendence. You don't feel transcendence all the time. You decide to experience transcendence and put yourself in, 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 in the circumstance stances to experience awe. You know, a lot of times you, I'm, I'm sure you go outside and there's a lot on your mind. You've got a very busy and hectic and stressful life and you don't feel it. You don't feel it every single day. Like I go to mass every day. I don't feel it every day. I wake up an atheist a lot. And why do you do that? I do that because it's part, it was part of the protocol for, for living the life that I want to live. I mean, I get up at 445, like you, right? I work out for an hour, body. I go to mass, soul. Then I work. That's when my creativity is highest. Now, of course, I'm also, you notice, I'm optimizing my dopamine. I'm bringing, I'm, I'm sucking as much dopamine into my prefrontal cortex, which gives me creativity and focus for the three hours that I need to write. And that's a, that's a good motivation to do so. But I also want to optimize both body and soul at the very beginning of the day. So I'm, I'm, I'm centered on the things that really matter to me, notwithstanding how I feel. I wake up at 4.45 in the morning. I'm like, back day? I don't want to do back day. I don't want to, leg day? I don't want to do that, but I do it. I do it. And it's, it's, the, it's the discipline of the will that in and of itself is so important. And then I go to mass. I don't want to do it a lot of days. I don't want to do it, but that's not the point. Do you, do you think that there is a, a deficit of that as well, of that idea of, so, so for example, you know, you alluded to marriage earlier and anybody who's listening to this, who's married, especially who's been married for many, many years will be the, you know, they'll acknowledge that so much of the, kind of almost perverse joy of marriage is that you make a lot of sacrifices for another person right. and you find yourself putting someone else ahead of yourself. Yeah. And for, for me, that's a very hard thing to do. Like I'm just so hardwired to be such a selfish guy that it's, it's really a wonderful practice to, 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 to do something where I know like I'm going to make my wife's coffee today yeah. because, you know, she would do the same for me. Well, part of that is that you have discovered, and not enough people have, that love is not a feeling either. Happiness is not a feeling, but love isn't either. Love is a commitment. Martin Luther King, one time he gave this very beautiful sermon <clears throat> on the most transgressive passage in the Christian Bible, which is Matthew 5, 44, love your enemies, right? And he says, Jesus says, today I give you a new teaching. You have heard that you should hate your enemies and love your friends. I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Now, he says, Jesus doesn't say to like your enemies because that's a sentimental thing. To like is to feel. To love is to decide. This is what's going on between you and your wife. The satisfaction, the disciplining of your own will comes from the decision to love her. That's the magic. That's the magic in marriage. That's the magic in friendship. That's the magic that you can have in a relationship with your kids. Look, if it were all about your feelings, hell, I'd be, I'd be divorced. God knows my wife would bail on me. I'm mean, a pain being around me. She decides every day to love me. She decides to love me. She, so Thomas Aquinas, based on Aristotle, Aristotle talked really compellingly about love and friendship. Arist, uh, Aquinas in, in 1265, writes the Summa Theologica, his you know, magisterial contribution to philosophy. I mean, he introduced, he reintroduced Aristotle to the West. Everybody was a Platonist mm -hmm. till, till Aquinas. And he defined love as to will the good of the other as other. When you're making your wife that cup of coffee, notwithstanding your feelings, you're willing her good for her, not you. And that, that discipline of the will to love another person like that, that decision to do so is completely transformative. That's transcendent to the day-to-day -day experience. So the animal path is, well, I'm not going to make coffee. I don't feel like it. The divine path is to love her, is to will her good as her. And that's, that's, the, that's the human distinction. That's what, that's organized life. So it really seems that that's almost a, a theme here of happiness, that happiness is much more about deliberate decision-making, deliberate choices, as opposed to reactive feelings, which I, I mean, that's obviously the extent to which we've discussed it, but you know, I, I, I think I like this thing that, that Oprah said, right? Which is, what did, what did she say? Happierness. Happierness. Yeah. The yeah. thing I liked the most that she said was, let's write a book. But yeah, totally. She said, let's spread this idea to a bunch of other people. And I mean, this is, like, I've been listening to your show for a long time. This is the, this is the salient theme. Take charge, man. Take charge. Don't, don't leave your 
health up to what feels good right now. Take charge of it. I mean, you're the boss. You're this is the startup is you. You're the entrepreneur. You're the you're the guy in charge of the enterprise. You're the CEO. Treat it as such. You know, the CEO doesn't do what feels good all the time. The CEO does what's right, notwithstanding her or his feelings. And that's the secret of happiness, is treating your life like a startup. It's like it's living, it's your philosophy of health and longevity is my philosophy of happiness because it's all one thing. You know, when you talk about better, happier years or, you know, health span, I'm talking about happy span. That's what it comes down to. And you're just not going to do it by doing what feels good in the moment. It's just not, you're not going to discipline the will sufficiently to be able to make the decisions that lead you on this divine path that can give you this thing that you actually seek. Is it perfect? No. But it, can you learn and grow and have progress all throughout the journey? Absolutely. Absolutely. Absolutely.